Whether you've ever sold a uh, bill pay or not, it's something to think about, be aware of. It can actually be a really profitable service, but there's also a lot of risk associated with it, which spooks people. I'm going to run you through uh, 10 big considerations, things you want to be sure you have nailed down in a bill pay service. This is something that I did quite a bit of, uh, and the goal is to kind of avoid the, the common traps and ensure that this is a, a profitable thing you can do responsibly. Uh, so let's do it. Come on in. Let's talk bill pay. Okay. Uh, one of the, I, I, I really like bill pay for a lot of reasons. A big thing is <clears throat> there's often things in a small business that are like sensitive in nature where they ultimately can't trust a third party to do it. And in my experience, those are oftentimes good things to stick your nose into because you're inherently this independent third party that already knows everything about these people's financial lives, right? Like you are in the thick of it as much as anybody else in their life. And generally people are are willing to pay for like trust, for uh, security, for propriety. And it's one of the few situations where like what they would pay you to pay the bills can be much, much more than what they would pay an internal person to pay the bills, which means if you can nail the process and avoid all of the gotchas, that's not a bad place to live if you can get a bunch of these engagements going with your clients. Now, bill pay looks wildly different for different types of businesses from super, super simplistic, you know, you don't need any of the detail on the bill, the person just needs to get paid, to mega detailed, you've got like manufacturing type applications or retail where on an itemized basis, I mean, you could have an invoice with 200 lines of detail that need to like be received into the system. That's very, very different. So it's hard to generalize all that into sort of one. We did some somewhat complex stuff, not like super hairy. And then we did some really basic stuff too. But I'm going to cruise through like through 10 considerations. If you're thinking about building this out that you will want to just think through and like make some notes on how does this fit into my service packages? Are we having these conversations and locking this stuff down for all of our engagements? Uh, straight off the top, just like very obvious no-nos. Whenever we did bill pay, we would never have the same internal staff person do both entry and approval. So before a client ever saw anything, it got an internal approval before it went to an external approver. And we would have one member of our team do that entry, a second member of our team do that internal approval. Second, if you are paying things for the client, they absolutely have to be, bills absolutely have to be approved according to the client's rules inside of the system. And some clients will always be trying to skirt those rules or they'll be in a rush or they'll be on vacation or whatever, but that is absolutely how theft happens uh, and phishing and stuff like that. So your entire team has to understand you are doing bill pay for this client within this scope. And if they're unwilling to do that on like a bill payment or something like that, it's going to be up to the client to figure out their own way to make that payment happen because it ain't running through my system. And that needs to be absolutely non-negotiable because if you have a bad actor in the works or somebody's able to impersonate that client, if they are in that system, obviously you need to take steps to like ensure that doesn't happen like multi-factor and stuff like that. But if something like that does happen, like it needs to be 1000% that client's fault, like not the fault of you or your team. Biggest issue with bill pay is it is kind of like payroll where you either got it done or you did it wrong. Like there's, it's, you can kind of only lose. There are no positive outcomes. And so a common example, like there's a payment in transit when an invoice sends, when a, when a vendor sends you an invoice and there's like a previous balance on there or something and somebody isn't paying attention and they pay the previous balance in addition to the current balance in like a new amount, even though they already paid the previous balance last month or something. Now your client is out, you know, $100 or $100,000 for this thing where maybe they didn't actually need to pay that. Uh, and so that can be like, that can be stressful, like it is higher stakes, but that's also why you can command more money for it. So second thing is it absolutely has to run through the system according to the client's approval guidelines every single time, no exceptions. And third, make sure you got insurance, you know, insurance, cyber insurance, you already should. But for some clients, you're going to be moving a lot of money and something goes sideways, you will be you'll be very happy that you had it. Now, if I haven't scared you off from doing that, 
Most of these things are managed manageable with controls and with tech. I mean, 100% of these things ought to be like, you have to ensure you have a system where somebody absolutely can't bungle it either intentionally or unintentionally. But 10 things to consider number one, and I don't want to dwell on this too far, but it is what software to use. And this is where everybody gets paralysis and they go through every single software and none of them do just exactly the thing that you want. Here's the thing, like here's my reality. In a perfect world, I would have a single tool that did everything that I needed for every single client that I had. And obviously there's a spectrum here. It would be lovely if all of your clients needed the exact same thing for bill pay. And if you have a very similar type of client, maybe that's the case. For most firms, you're supporting different types of people who are going to have different needs and different expectations. Some of those are habit. They've always done it that way. They're like, we pay bills once a week. And so you're like, okay, cool. We'll pay your bills once a week. And if that works, great. Like it's no change for them. But that's also not a reason to do it once a week, right? And so there are some reasons why things are that like there's a good reason for that, like a manufacturing company needing, you know, more levels of detail entered into the system than your dental clinic that just needs to make sure that that company just got paid. Some of those reasons for complexity are legit. Some of them are not. But all of those things oftentimes dictate what the best tool is for the job. And what I'm generally not a fan of is like going and grabbing a super, super complicated tool because I have one or two clients that need that super complicated tool. And I know that sucks that we're like fragmenting across systems. But in my mind, you run the risk of overcomplicating all the super simple stuff, right? And so obviously, if it's at all avoidable, yes, avoid it. But I personally don't I try to avoid super overthinking the software thing. I will say, and now I'm arguing with myself, there is a whole lot of platform lock-in when it comes to bill pay and these softwares know it. They want the vendors logging into their platform to manage their payment methods and all that stuff so that once you have 100 vendors on there, if you have to change that to a different system, everybody's gonna cry and it's gonna be a big old pain. And this is, you know, bill.com knows this. This is why they've been around forever. So switching costs there, like that can be pretty painful. So if I can, I will try to do all of this stuff through a single system, but the, the system that will simultaneously handle the really complex stuff while making the simple stuff as easy as it can be, it's usually not the same system, unfortunately. Okay, seven, second thing to be thinking about, who's carrying the cost? Most platforms will have a, a fixed monthly plus a per user cost, but then they will also have a per payment cost. And I, in my engagements, would generally carry the software costs because I just, I was not interested in having that debate. And we were like, just, we were doing larger engagements. So the software cost wasn't a huge thing. If, you know, they increased monthly fees, $20 a month, like wasn't the end of the world because we're trying to not take engagements under, you know, a couple grand a month or something. But when it comes to bill pay, it's a little stickier here because these are per transaction fees. Uh, and oftentimes, if you have to expedite a payment, like that will be more expensive also. And if, for example, a client, you know, is dragging their feet, we got to expedite a bunch of stuff. And that's, you know, 20 bucks to overnight each check or something like that. I don't really want to eat that. So if you're like me, and you normally carry the cost of software for clients, this here may be an exception, you may want it to actually bill to that client directly. You sick of hearing people talking about AI, yet you get into the office and you're like, I, my inbox is still a dumpster fire, buddy, can you actually give me something that'll save me some time? I, I'm ready. Same, same bro. Listen, Client Hub, today's sponsor, you wanna know their mantra? AI, a Client Hub AI is not tomorrow, it's, it's today, buddy. It is, it's already happening. They're already shipping stuff in product that are super cool AI, large language model driven solutions. They're not just talking about it and putting out webinars about how cool this stuff is. Like they've actually are, are implementing it into their product in really meaningful ways. In fact, I don't know, they're one of the only companies that I've seen that have actually publicly put that roadmap out there to say, gang, here's the stuff that we are most excited about right now and here's the stuff we're working really hard on. Uh, and they're even extending like early beta access to some of these features for the folks who are most excited to be on the cutting edge of things. I know a lot of whom listen to this podcast. Picking your tech partners is as much about where they are today as where they are going tomorrow and the things that they're investing in. You got concerns about whether your partner's investing in AI, check out ClientHub. 
Might be for you, link in the show notes. You ever thought, man, if only there was a portal for all of these portals, one portal to rule them all, the portal portal, you know? And we say this kind of tongue in cheek, but also kind of not because we really don't like giving our clients fragmented experiences. Uh, spoiler alert, Copilot, sponsor of this video. That's kind of their mantra is uh, the portal for your portals. The notion that you can plug in any of the other tools that you use into Copilot to give people a single place to manage their stuff. Totally customize like all of the options that the client sees within that portal, even down to the client level. Like you can have different clients see different options down the left hand side. Copilot's got a bunch of its own like built in tooling, but you can also embed a bunch of the other tools you use into Copilot giving clients a single place that they can log in and see all that stuff all in one place, which is the holy grail, right? Uh, I don't know, like, there's often times where one more tool for all of the tools isn't the solution, but for portals, ugh, I, I can't think of a better solution. Cause we're at, like, we've got all these different places we gotta go log into all these things, right? And so if that's something that you've grappled with, Copilot might be for you. Uh, check out a link to Copilot in the show notes. Number three, <clears throat> how will approvals work? How much complexity is there? Like, uh, do you have different people within an org approving different types of bills? Like is one person approving the advertising bills and then another person approving all the other ones? Is there branching logic? Can uh, one person from a pool of people be the one to approve it? Is the second approver contingent upon who the first approver is? Are there dollar thresholds here? There's like, this can be really frustrating because there's a million different permutations of this. There are some standalone approval apps where sometimes I think you're genuinely better bolting on a beefy approval, dedicated approval app to your bill payment app of choice to just handle the approval side rather than having to go to maybe a bill pay platform that is like unwieldy because it will handle this complexity. Sometimes if being able to keep everybody on the bill pay system can be accommodated by pulling in an approval tool just on the few clients where it's needed, sometimes that's a better compromise. But approvals can absolutely be like a hidden trap as you're getting into a an engagement, especially for folks who are currently doing it in a very manual way or in a physical office where there is like, oh no, I just walk across the hall here in this situation or over here in that situation, that stuff can be really hard to navigate and a, a sneaky source of complexity that you may not be aware of until you get into it. So definitely make sure you have all those approvals mapped out before getting into an engagement so everybody's on the same page. Uh, number four, the type of payments that you're going to allow for uh, ACH wire paper check how people get paid if they don't have bank accounts even. How much are you going to bend to vendor preferences? So if a vendor wants a paper check, is that okay or not? If a vendor is unbanked, is that okay or not? These are all conversations you wanna make sure you have with the client up front. There are pros and cons to each. We were talking about vendor lock-in, like pushing an invite to the client to get them to log in and add their bank details like that is creating vendor lock-in. It kind of sucks. If I just had that, that client's account numbers and could just pop it into the system and send an ACH direct to that account number, I would probably prefer that because then that vendor isn't like locked into that system. Now there's some benefits to the vendors having access to the system, like being able to go back and see old payments and see when a payment's in transit, stuff like that. But it's all stuff to think about when you're talking through uh, what that plan's going to be for the client. And my experience, like client procedures around this stuff, and I worked with SMB, so these weren't super mature organizations by any means. And my experience, like their processes are developed just kind of by stumbling into them. And like, this is what Tina always did. And that was kind of what drove it. And you're gonna have to peel some of those onion layers back as you're navigating this. Number five, uh, what are the rules when expediting may be necessary? Who eats the fees? What if, you know, something slips through the cracks on your end and you gotta expedite it? Are you gonna pay for that? What if the client pops something in late? Do you always expedite to make a deadline? Are there scenarios where you do expedite, where you don't expedite? How do discounts come into play there? Do you only expedite it when the discount is greater than, than the fee to expedite it? Can you tell I've done this and gotten it wrong in a lot of very nuanced ways? This is why I'm trying to lay all this stuff out for you so you can think through each of these things. Number six, who's ensuring that there is adequate cash to pay the bill? Uh, so if a client tasks you with paying their bills and in the first week you pay a bill and they overdraft, are they going to be like, what the heck are you doing, knucklehead? Or are they going to be like, my bad, I should have been on top of that. 
This is a big one because when you have a very complex org with like a bunch of outstanding payments and if they run their cash tight, it can actually be a tremendous amount of work to figure out day to day is their cash available and it completely changes the requirements of the information that you need. Let's say somebody wrote a check. If my job is to now know uh, if you have cash to pay your bills or, or not, I need to know like any checks that are going out, like Paper checks, obviously, if that's still a thing. But let's say you've got a big old wire that's set to go out tomorrow. Like now I have to know about all of that stuff if I'm accountable for knowing if there will be cash available to pay the bills. And this is a tough one with SMBs because a lot of them run cash like just by the seat of their pants a week at a time. But get really, really explicit about whose job it is to make sure that there's money in the account because this can be as big of a project if not bigger than the bill pay stuff itself, like monitoring cash and ensuring they have adequate money to pay bills. Number seven, the frequency that you're gonna pay their bills and all the nuance that goes into that. So for example, let's say you're gonna come in, you're gonna pay their bills once a week. What does that actually mean? Because in my case, I'm gonna have a team member enter it. We're gonna do an internal approval. It's gonna to go to client for external approval. And then we are going to initiate payment. And obviously every step along the way there has latency from, okay, if I tell the client we're gonna pay the bills once a week on Wednesdays, does that mean that's the only time we touch that file so that my staff goes in and enters the bills on Wednesday? but then also does the internal approval on Wednesday and then just hopes that the client gets to that approval on Wednesday so that we can then pay it on Wednesday. Or does me paying on Wednesday mean I'm going to be entering on Monday? And like, so you got to like nail down the nuance there so that the client understands also the worst case scenario. So uh, for example, you know, if they then give you, if, if you get via email an invoice on Thursday, does that mean then that it won't ultimately be paid until almost a week later. And is that okay? This is honestly a tricky one to navigate. What we ultimately got to was we actually time blocked periods during the day where there was like a two hour bill entry window, where if that were was the client's bill day, uh, the team that did the entry had to knock that out within a window of time during the day so that then the internal approvers had a couple hours after that to get in and do all of the approvals so that we could make sure that we at least internally blocked all that stuff within a single day. But then as soon as it goes out the door for an external approval, like that's really outside your control, you know? Actually, one thing here, uh, some platforms allow for you to like schedule a payment to automatically happen once it gets through approval which would have been a huge quality of life improvement for me because we had the issue of it going to an external approver and then we're like, well, is it still their bill pay day? Do we get back in now and pay the bills? Especially if they got five approvers in an organization and everybody's approving things at a different time. If we only pay bills once a week, it's like, well, heck, all these things are trickling through. When do you go in to pay them? And so you just got to make that stuff all really explicit up front. But a system that will release that payment as soon as everything's been approved, or at least like you can set the date for when you want it paid before everything has been approved and it won't go out until it's approved. That's super cool, like big quality of life improvement. We are so in the weeds right now. 50% of people are like, what the hell am I listening to? Archive. The other 50 are like, I'm into this. I need to share this with Tina. Number eight. What happens when somebody is on vacay, either internal or external? If you got a small business where there's just one approver and they're gonna be gone for a couple of weeks, how does that work? Internally, how does that stuff work? Like who is the backup approver? We use generally like more of a pooled approach internally so that this wasn't as problematic, but in the early days when we didn't have many people doing this stuff and one person was gone, you can't like blow up your internal controls because you don't now have enough people to handle each step along the way, right? So number eight, be thinking about what happens when people either internal or external are gone. Gang, this episode is sponsored in part by Liveflow. Uh, Liveflow is the easiest way to sync that QuickBooks data back and forth to your spreadsheets. You may have seen this actually had a big announcement lately. So this fall, G2 gave them the top spot in their fall 2023 report as the leader in the financial analysis category. That's right, they won. 
number one. Nice work. Uh, if you've been around my channels for a while, you've seen Life Float kindly. They have sponsored quite a bit of stuff. And I'm not, I mean, I'm not saying I'm taking credit for it, but that was probably why. If you're not familiar with Live Flow, super easy way to sync that stuff, sync your QuickBooks data back and forth with Google Sheets. They got a whole pile of templates too to make the process of building that stuff for the first time as easy as possible for you. Stuff for managing cash, AP, KPIs, like everything you can imagine. Sync that data into your existing sheets to make them smarter, get it to auto sync or build your like custom new sheets that talk with QuickBooks totally from scratch. Uh, pretty cool tool. Check that one out at liveflow.io. This episode is sponsored in part by the fine folks at Cloud Accountant Staffing. Do you hire accountants? Bless your little heart. Uh, not the best part of the job, in my opinion. Not something I ever enjoyed. Well, listen, you can build your accounting dream team, dream team. with talented offshore accountants in the Philippines that work 100% full time for your firm. Their accountants aren't freelancing or contracting for multiple firms. They're all yours. They work exclusively for you and are incentivized to stay with you and your team long term. They're not going to get swiped. Cloud Account Staffing is 100% dedicated to the accounting industry and founded by a former accounting firm owner that understands your business, knows your pain points. They had to hire some accountants and they said, you know what? We're going to build our own pipeline in the Philippines. Going to pull in some super talented people and then open that up to other firms. Basically, that's the story. Uh, I've been talking about a lot about staffing, building more resilient staffing pipelines for your firms. I, I had staff in the Philippines, I, like totally red pilled me to like, oh geez, like we need to globalize the way that we get our work done. Uh, check these folks out. Link in the show description, cloudaccountantstaffing.com. Uh, nine and 10 are biggies. And this is where you can differentiate your service and where I think it gets really interesting and really valuable for your client. So number nine, it, and I like people don't generally talk about these and it's actually because it's funny it's because these things are both outside like the purview of what the bill pay softwares handle like it's an example of how I think so much of our dialogue around this is driven by the vendors trying to get us to buy their platforms but number nine what happens before it gets to the bill pay system because things don't just manifest themselves in a bill pay system automatically they got to go from a to b and that's usually in my experience, where most things fall through the cracks. So who knows where all of the bills are coming in right now? Maybe it's mail, email, it could be across a bunch of different email inboxes. The reality is in an SMB, usually that's going to be happening a bunch of different places, unfortunately. And the best thing that you can help them with is to set up an accounting at their domain.com email or a bills at their domain or an AP at their domain so that Anytime they're, they've got a service they're setting up, they set that email address up to get the email notifications and it goes directly there. Now, a fallback, uh, if they don't want to set all those things up directly with the vendor, so you can set up rules like email inbox rules for wherever those emails are going to redirect a copy to accounts payable at their domain.com. And then you will manage that inbox for them. And it's not to say that you're going to be able to handle every single little thing that comes in there. But what you don't want is a whole bunch of touch points before it gets to you. You don't want it getting mailed in to Tina, who then needs Gary to scan it in, who then needs Teddy to email it to you. That's like, that's just a nightmare. Because then something's late and you got a whole bunch of finger point, pointing happening. You want that stuff going straight, straight to that, that email inbox. Now, I would argue... You want it to go to that domain email inbox, not directly to the bill pay platform because platform lock-in and what happens if you ever need to go to a different system. You're now unwinding that with a whole bunch of different vendors. Whereas using like an AP email, to me, like that's, where's that gonna go? Like if we send stuff to Sheila at their domain.com, like, yeah, that's a problem if Sheila leaves. How many, how many of those like zombie email accounts have we seen where there's so many things going to them? And it's just like, well, this is just how it's going to be until the end of time because we're never going to unwind this. And then everyone emails Sheila and you're like, hey, no, Steve here. Sheila's sick. But to me, like the best compromise here seems like, you know, bills or AP at their domain.com. And that's a process getting everything pointed there correctly, but you can manage that stuff for them and quality of life improvement of you doing all that for them. Like that's really, really nice. And you can manage that email inbox to, uh, you know, actually what, what we would do then is we would use inbox rules on that, you know, AP at their domain email to forward 
recurring invoices into the bill pay system. So we wouldn't set up, you know, most bill pay systems will have like Tim's heating at, you know, bill.com or, or whatever. And anything you send to that inbox, it will pull into the bill pay software. We would not set that address up with the vendors directly, but we would point that to us. And then we would use an inbox rule to then point that to the bill pay platform. And to me, that was better because we had internal control over those rules and we didn't have to go out to the vendor and you know change that email address if we ever wanted to change the bill pay platform. So that was kind of the best of both worlds. Uh, and the difference was like, rather than going through that whole chain of command and all these different people, literally, like as soon as the vendor sent out that email, it would populate in the bill pay platform immediately because we had those rules set up. And most bill pay is recurring stuff from the same vendors. And so if you're getting that email every single month or every single week, it's absolutely worth the effort to set that to auto route into the bill pay system. So think about what happens before the bills go into the system. When I very first started this, I was like, yeah, I'll pay your bills. And the person was like, well, the person who did this before that you're relieving, they actually did all this other peripheral stuff. And I'm like, oh crap, I don't know how to do any of that. And that sounds like way more work. That like what happens before is absolutely one of those things. And then number 10, what happens after? So who do vendors reach out to if they're looking for a payment? What happens when a payment fails? Like if you send it a paper check and it returns or if the account numbers are bad, like what is the process there? If you need to actually get in touch with the vendor, maybe they don't give you a discount that you should have gotten. Whose job is it to get in touch? There's a lot of these sort of fringe little uh, things where if the goal is to free up a person on the client's team to go to other stuff, they're going to be like, oh, why do I keep getting sucked into this bill pay thing? And then it's kind of a mess because they're coming to you asking questions and then like playing telephone with the vendors. Uh, this is an area where you can actually be really helpful for clients by staying on top of that inbox. That's probably still something that just gets managed out of that same, you know, AP at their domain or accounting at their domain inbox. And it is, um, to me, much more valuable than like this transactional, oh, what am I going to have to pay you to pay, you know, 200 bills a month or something like that. It's like, no, you're genuinely doing something that you would otherwise have to hire an internal person to do and like sit there and manage that inbox. But because you're wicked smart, you've got like the automation tools to make this as effective as possible. You're doing it in bulk actually for a bunch of clients. And you're like generally just going to do this better than the client because you have a better handle on the internal controls that are necessary. And you're going to use the right tool for the job that'll do like OCR extraction on the bills and ensure that that whole thing's not a big manual process. Now, that may seem like a lot if you haven't done this before, and like a whole bunch of fiddly little things that could be different client to client. So then how do you standardize this to make this understandable for your team? We basically simplified it down to a few different service levels. And those service levels would be collections of different expectations. So you could have service level one, two, three. And then you also have frequency as this independent thing. So that could be daily, could be every Tuesday, Friday, could be weekly, could be monthly. And for us, all that actually looked like in practice was we would have recurring tasks for getting the bill pay done. And then we had custom fields on those recurring tasks that were like all of the engagement specific things about that. So obviously, you know, how frequently we we're going to do that, that dictates the recurrence of the task who's ensuring there's adequate cash to pay, like that's a custom field on that task that is like one of several options. Maybe it's just check cash or, you know, ensure adequate cash or a client will ensure adequate cash or something like that. And there ended up being like a bunch of different combinations of what that could be. But there were maybe like, I don't know, three or four custom fields and everybody knew what, what exactly they had to do depending on how that field was set. And then ultimately what those fields were, like that was the client engagement and the service levels that they had. But um, you can, like this can actually be a pretty profitable thing. You can absolutely charge, you know, the cost of an employee or several employees, depending on how large of a company this is and what the need is. It's one of those things that I look for that is sort of at the intersection of either can I offshore a lot of it or can I automate a lot of it? And in this case, we could actually do both. So like we generally had offshore folks handling most of the entry. They were concealed from all the payment stuff. But then the bill pay platforms themselves and how we were automate, able to automate those like we're getting better really fast. And now AI-based extraction has like taken that another big step in like 
how well it can automatically pull that stuff out of there. And we've there's almost this arbitrage opportunity where you know the best tools for the job and you can squeeze everything that you can out of this. And it is otherwise probably going to be a very, very manual process for that client. So if you've got a butt in the chair, you know, 40 hours a week at the client's office that is doing all of this stuff and they're making, I don't know, 60 grand a year. And so that person's ultimately costing them 70 grand a year. You can come in with a proposal that is more, absolutely more than 70 grand a year to say like, we're going to be able to manage all this stuff for you. You're going to have, you know, killer tools to see into getting all the information that you need. Your vendor is going to have a more smooth experience. We're never going to be on vacation. Like this will just be a higher level service than you can reasonably expect from just having an admin person do this for you now. And in my experience, when you've got all that information in your hands, it actually leads to some other cool stuff. So most of the people we were doing bill pay for, we were actually also doing cash reporting for, which they would pay even more for because this was the biggest stressor for these people in their business is where's my cash at? Where's it going to be in 30 days? With all the information you have, you could put together some really compelling information around that. Like you are aggregating all that information in a more meaningful way than it ever has been before. So in almost like all of our cases where we did bill pay, it actually led to other more premium, I don't know if I'd call them advisory, probably more controllership type of stuff where we could give them really good reporting week over week that they wouldn't otherwise have access to, uh, that they like absolutely grew to depend on. It was like kind of the lifeblood of their business. And so when you combine those two things and how that can lead into some more valuable stuff that you can charge top dollar for, because otherwise you're going to have to go out and pay a pretty expensive internal person to do this for you. If they can even get the, like the systems down, like we have them down for them. You roll all that stuff up together and they ended up like being pretty profitable engagements. It's also a, a way to like differentiate your firm too. So if you're if you're wanting to get into folks, especially with nuanced bill pay needs like manufacturing or something like that, and you really nail this, that could be a, a killer way to like attract clients to that specific offering of yours. The notion that they no longer have to do this thing in house because their accountant's actually going to help them do it, like help them manage it. Something to think about. Uh, it was something that uh we did well we did badly in some cases learned some lessons but it's one of the very few things that we did that virtually nobody ever dropped once we started doing it for them they're like yeah no thanks i'm never going to take this back in house so uh you got any bill pay related wisdom absolutely drop it in the comments um if this is something you're stuck on or you've been thinking about it, uh, share that too. I think we're going to be doing Q&As uh, every Friday now. So if there's anything more that would be helpful to unpack there, let me know. And I'll see you in the next one.